Good morning, church. Pastor Justin here with you again today uh, for our weekly Bible study. I uh, just want you to know I'm extremely blessed uh, by getting to do this each week. I hope that you're being blessed um, by this time uh, together. Again, I know it's not ideal and we all want to be together here again uh, as, as the body of Christ, but I'm so thankful to the Lord uh, for modern technology and the opportunity uh, to be able to still communicate His Word and share His Word uh, with you. So uh, would you join me in prayer this morning? Father, thank you for this time uh, together. I pray, God, that you would just open our hearts and minds to the Word that you have for us today. Father, we ask that your spirit would uh, just give us wisdom, give us understanding, Father, to take your word and to apply it to our lives. Father, I lift up my brothers and sisters to you, Father, in this difficult season of life. Father, I pray just encouragement over them. God, I pray grace upon them. I pray your protection uh, over them, Father. And God, we continue to cry out asking you, Lord, uh, to, to eradicate this coronavirus from the face of the earth, Father. We ask you to heal those who are sick. We ask you to provide for those who are struggling financially, those that have lost their jobs. God, we look to you as our sovereign Lord, uh, and we cry out, Father, heal our land. So God, be with us now as we open up your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you would, turn with me in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And we're going to be looking at verses 17 through 32 uh, this morning. Uh, just kind of as a <clears throat> word of confession uh, to you this morning, I just want you to know, uh, as maybe you were studying this passage this week, I don't know how you felt, uh, but I had a really hard time uh, with this passage. Uh, this passage was pretty difficult uh, to, to um, study, and uh, just in all uh, honesty, I'm a little nervous uh, this morning in teaching uh, this message because uh, it, it was challenging. Um, you know, uh, in, in one sense, it was actually very humbling uh, this week, preparing for this message, and uh, God just once again reminded me of how when it comes to studying the Scripture, we have to be completely dependent upon Him for understanding. You know, uh, a number of years ago, God really taught me uh, this lesson in that um, I was teaching a group of junior and senior boys at a youth camp. Uh, a good friend of mine was running a youth camp, and I had taken my students uh, at a previous church to camp that year, and my friend had asked me if I would lead all of the Bible studies for the junior and senior boys at camp. And so about a month or so before camp started, uh, they sent me um, the lessons, they sent me the scriptures and a general outline of each lesson. Um, of course, I had to flesh out uh, the, the lesson, but they gave me the passage and some general points. And for most of the lessons, I had them all prepared, ready to go, no problem. But there was this one particular lesson that I was really struggling with because the scripture they had given me and the topic they gave me, they didn't seem like they really uh, jived or that they didn't connect well. So I was really struggling and camp was getting closer. And so it came time to go to camp and I didn't have the lesson done. In fact, uh, it, it came to the night before. I was in my room, probably close to midnight, having to teach uh, this particular lesson at 8.30, 9 o'clock the next morning, and I still had nothing. <clears throat> and it was in that moment that God spoke very clearly to me in my spirit, and He said, You see, Justin, you're not as smart as you think you are. I don't care uh, if you've been to seminary or not. You can't say anything about my word that I don't reveal to you. And man, that just really struck me. And I said, Lord, I am so sorry you were right. Because you see, I was depending upon my theological education to help me to understand the passage and to help me to be able to teach it. And I'll never forget that. And it's so funny because as I, was, as I read and studied this week, I, I kind of felt the same way. I was like, I, I don't get where this lesson's going. I don't understand what Paul is talking about. I've studied, you know, I've read this many times, but I just don't understand. And again, the Lord just reminds me, Justin, I'm the one who brings understanding. So that's what I'm doing today, church. I'm, I'm relying on the Lord here. Um, 
I want you to know, though, there are a couple of things that made me feel a little bit better about this. First, as I was studying, as I was um, uh, looking and reading different uh, scholars, it was so interesting because almost all of them said that this Romans chapter 11 is probably the most difficult passage to understand, chapter to understand in the book of Romans, uh, that, that many scholars struggle with trying to get what Paul's talking about. And so I was like, well, man, if guys so much smarter than me are saying this is difficult and they don't really get it, then I feel a lot better about myself. But not only that, I want you to listen to this. In 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, the apostle Peter Talking about Paul, the Apostle Paul says, As also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand. So even the Apostle Peter is saying, you know, sometimes our brother Paul is hard to understand. And so I thought, well, man, if scholars, biblical scholars say that Romans chapter 11 is difficult to understand, and even the Apostle Peter says this Paul is sometimes difficult to understand. Well, then, man, I'm in pretty good company, so I don't feel quite as bad. But still, we're relying on the Lord today, uh, and I'm excited to see what God wants to show us uh, in His Word. So again, we're in Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 32. Uh, but before we go in there, let me just kind of give you um, a, a run through of where we are uh, in Romans. Again, if you remember a few weeks back, in Romans 9 and 10, Paul was emphasizing that salvation is through faith alone. That salvation comes by us confessing uh, Jesus as our Savior and believing that God raised Him from the dead, but also in acknowledging Him as Lord. His, it was Jesus' sacrifice that paved the way for us to come to faith in Christ. Paul also, uh, in Romans 10, he emphasizes the universal nature of God's offer for salvation. That salvation is for all who would receive it. For anyone who would place their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Paul said that all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And then as he moves uh, into chapter 11, he talks about the Jews and their stubbornness uh, to respond to God and in fact how they rejected uh, God. But yet Paul believed that the Jews, uh, that, they were not, that they were not without hope. There was still hope that they would turn from their sin and that they would return to God. God. But you know, the Jews re initially rejecting the gospel ended up being a benefit for the Gentiles because the message went forth from Jerusalem into the world, into the Gentile world. And so here we stand today, over 2,000 years uh, since this time. And we have the gospel made available to us because the Jews had rejected God. Now, Paul wants to make the point in chapter 11 that in time, um, Israel will come back. That the fact that the Gentiles have responded so positively to the gospel, it will eventually lead the Jews to come back to God. But not on their terms, on God's terms. And so here we come uh, to chapter 11. So if we would, again, let's look in Romans chapter 11, beginning in verse 17. But as some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches, but if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root that supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right, they were broken off for their unbelief, but you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited. But fear, for if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Behold then the kindness and the severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness. Otherwise, you will be cut off also. 
And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. Just as it is written, the Deliverer will come from Zion, and he will remove ugliness from Jacob. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that, that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that he may show mercy to all. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his word. So just like we do each week, I'd like, this, I'd like us to just take our time and let's walk through this passage uh, together. So again, let's, let's take it in chunks uh, and let's look at verses seven, uh, 17 and 18 again. But as some of the branches were broken off, and you, being a wild olive, were grafted in among them and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. But if you are arrogant... Remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. So here, Paul uses the image uh, of the tree, specifically the process of grafting uh, branches uh, as a vehicle to demonstrate uh, the Gentiles, um, excuse me, the Gentiles' role and Israel's role in God's plan and to warn the Gentiles um, against having arrogance towards the Jews. Uh, the olive tree um, is occasionally used as a symbol to represent uh, the nation of Israel. And the branches that he talks about that have been broken off are the unbelieving Jews. So here he talks about two different types of olive trees. He, he will talk of the cultivated olive tree, which represents the Jews, and the wild olive tree, which will represent uh, the Gentiles. Again, he talks about the broken branches, some of the branches were broken off. Again, these were Jews. These were the Jews who had rejected Jesus uh, as the Messiah, who did not respond in faith uh, to the gospel message. He says that, uh, that they have been removed. But some of the branches were not removed, meaning that there were some Jews who had responded to the gospel. And obviously, all of those writers of Scripture were Jewish, right? All of the apostles were Jewish. They had responded. Many had responded. Um, Jesus not only had the 12, but Scripture talks of the 70 and then the 120 that were in the upper room. And then on the day of Pentecost, 3,000. And as you move through the books of, book of Acts, at another time, there were 5,000. And so many were coming. So there were many Jews who had responded. But the broken off branches... Uh, were the Jews who had rejected uh, the gospel. So, uh, the, all, the wild olive branches are the Gentiles, and it says that they have been cultivated into the olive tree representing Israel. So, Paul talks about that as, as Gentiles, as we have come into the faith, as we have been adopted into the family of God, we have become a part of the chosen people. We have become a part of Israel by adoption. And because of that, because we have become a part of Israel, because, because we have become a part of God's family, we uh, are brought into all of the blessings of God. We get, we get to enjoy some of that fruit. But if some of the branches were broken off and you, being a wild one, were grafted in among them, 
and became partakers with them of the rich root of the olive tree. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root. So again, Paul warning the Jews, I mean, excuse me, the Gentiles uh, of not becoming arrogant of uh, the Jews. So obviously the implication is that there were some Gentiles in the Roman church who were beginning to look down on the Jews to think that they were superior to the Jews simply because they had received Christ and the Jews had rejected Christ. And so Paul wants to discourage the Gentiles from boasting of their superiority. Again, having experienced firsthand God's opening the door of salvation to the Gentiles, the danger here was that the Gentiles would begin to think that God's actions somehow came from their own worth. That somehow they were more worthy because they had accepted God's message of salvation, His gift of salvation, His gift of forgiveness, and the Jews had not. They had rejected Him. So it was, it was becoming easy for the Gentiles to kind of be puffed up and even to become prideful. Paul reminds them that God's grafting them in into the, into the tree, the cultivated tree. God's bringing them into the family was totally an act of His grace. And what is grace? Grace is God's unmerited favor upon us. And so his bringing them in was an act of pure grace. Now, uh, in the book, there's a great question here. And it says, what makes religious pride so crippling and so dangerous? Because see, this was the issue. The Gentiles were becoming proud. And, and, and the issue, the answer to that question, what makes religious pride so crippling and so dangerous is that it leads us to focus on ourselves. Religious pride, religious piety can cause you to think that you are better than other people. It's very easy and there is a temptation for Christians to look down on non-Christians. To look at non-Christians and think, oh, you know, look at, look at these people. Look at the sin that they engage in. I am so much better. I am a Christian. I am a good Christian. I go to church every Sunday. I pray. I read my Bible. I give my tithe. I'm involved in the children's ministry or I serve as a greeter at my church. You know, I am more, I am... I am better, I mean, well really, I'm better than them, that's the, that's, that can be the mentality, or I am so much more holy than they are. Religious pride is dangerous, church, and let's just be honest, religious pride, any type of pride in that sense that would put self first is sin. And remember, God does not weigh sin. All sin is the same in the eyes of God. And so we have to be very careful because if, if we're not careful, we can think that somehow we are worthy of the salvation that we have received, the grace that we have received, instead of remembering that we have to be completely dependent upon God. It is only by the grace of God that we are in the faith. You know that saying, there, by the, there but by the grace of God go I. That really needs to be the case, and that's what Paul is trying to communicate here to the Gentiles. Is that, look, it wasn't anything special about you that God, God made salvation available to you. You're not more special than the Jewish people. Do not be arrogant towards the branches. But if you are arrogant, remember that it is not you who supports the root, but the root supports you. What was the root? When he was talking about the root, he was referring back to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and how it was through them that faith, uh, that the opportunity to respond in faith came in that through the patriarchs, 
came the covenant. God made the covenant with the patriarchs. And God, uh, God made promises to the patriarchs. God uh, provided blessings to the patriarchs. And it would be eventually that through that line that the Messiah would be born. And so Paul's telling these Gentiles, hey, don't look down on these guys just because they're broken branches, just because they rejected Christ. If it wasn't for the, through the Jewish line, you would know nothing about the promises of God. You would know nothing about the covenant. You would not have been able to have been grafted into the family of God and be able to receive the blessings of grace and mercy, forgiveness, salvation. So don't be too arrogant. You need the root to be sustained. Verses 19 through 21. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. First, again, look at verse 21. For if God did not spare the... Na oh, excuse me. Verse, I, I missed a verse. Verse 19. You will say then, branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. Quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand by your faith. So... Again, Paul saying to the, to the Gentiles, yes, there were branches that were broken off. These were the Jews that had rejected Christ. But the reason that they were broken off was so that then the message could go out to the Gentiles, right? The, so that branches were broken off so that I might get in. Quite right, they were broken off. But why were they broken off? It wasn't because the Gentiles were any better. It's not because they were more special. It's not because God wanted to abandon the Jews. No. These broken branches were broken off because of what? Their unbelief. Because they chose to reject Christ, because they chose to reject the gospel, they were broken off. And Paul now is warning them. He's warning the Gentiles that they must stand in faith. Branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. 20, quite right. They were broken off for their unbelief. But you stand in faith. And he's going to go on and warn them. Hey, don't get too prideful. Don't get too arrogant here. Because just as the, the broken branches, the, some of the Jews were broken off, you can be broken off too if you do not stand in faith. Do not be conceited, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, He will not spare you either. So again, don't think, Gentiles, that you are so good that you can't fall just like the Jews. That you can't be broken off either, just like the Jews. He, he's warning them, saying, take care. Again, the Jews had trusted their righteousness based on the law. They thought if they followed the law that they would be made righteous. But Paul has already talked about that righteousness doesn't come through the law. Righteousness comes through faith. Their lack of faith in the completed work of Christ on the cross is what led to the broken branches, the, the Jews being broken off from the tree. Salvation comes through faith alone. And we have to be careful that we do not become so prideful or arrogant to think that we are something because we're not. Salvation is purely a gift of God. It is by grace, through faith. It's not of ourselves so that none of us can boast. Let's go on to verse 22. Behold then, the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, otherwise you will be cut off. So here, Paul giving, is going to contrast two different sides of God's character, God's kindness versus God's severity. 
And you have to keep these two in balance because they are part of God's character. So much time, we want to focus on the one, and that's God's kindness, right? We like to talk about God as a loving God. God is a forgiving God. He is a God who is kind and who will show us grace and mercy. And all those are true. That's exactly who He is. But God also has a side of Him that is righteous and holy. And because of that, he deals with sin severely. And we can't take that likely. You see, God's kindness was demonstrated in his including the Gentiles by grafting them into the tree. You know, if God wanted to, he could have only saved the Jewish people. But he didn't. He offered salvation both to the Jew and to the Gentile. That's why when the Bible says that God so loved the world, He means the whole world. When the Bible says that God wishes that none would perish, but that all would come to repentance, it means all. It's not just the Jewish world. It's not just the Jewish people. But it's the whole world God has made salvation available to. And that is an act of His kindness. But His severity is seen in His judgment. Right? His severity is seen in the broken branches. That because they have chosen, because those Jews at that time had chosen to reject Christ, and for all today, Jew or Gentile, who, who chooses to reject Christ, they have no part in the root. They have no part in the covenant. They have no part in the promises or the blessings of God. And they face the severity of God. Behold then the kindness and severity of God to those who fell severity, but to you God's kindness. Church, I want to tell you today, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, then you are experiencing the kindness of God upon you. His kindness is upon you. Earlier in Romans, Paul reminds them that God's kindness is meant to lead us to repentance. It's meant to lead us to repentance. Again, though, even though God is kind, He is not so kind that He will overlook our sin. God does condemn sin. God expects faithfulness. Right? There was, a, there was an element or an aspect of faithfulness when it came to the covenant. God promised that He would keep His part of the covenant, but He expects us to keep our part of the covenant. Verse 23 and 24. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted in to their own olive tree? Again, Paul emphasizing equal treatment of both Jew and Gentile. So just as the, the Gentiles had been grafted in uh, because of their faith, the Jews could also be gra regrafted in if they turned from their unbelief. And they also, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. This is one of the awesome things about God, church. God is a forgiving God. There is, nothing that, there is nothing that you could do, no sin that you commit, that God will not forgive if you turn to Him. If you seek His forgiveness, if you repent of that sin, there is no sin that God will not forgive. As long as there is breath in your lungs, as long as your heart is beating, the opportunity to repent of our sin is still there. God makes it available for all. He loves all. It's only that once life is ended, all those who have rejected Jesus Christ will have to face the consequences of their decision. 
For if you were cut off from what is by nature a wild olive tree and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? Again, the opportunity was there, Paul is saying, for the Jews uh, to come back. Again, it doesn't seem it, it, it doesn't seem natural, but God can do anything. Even though the Jews had turned, God could help to restore them. As it said, there's nothing that is impossible for God. From the quarterly, Paul makes the point here. This isn't just theoretical. In fact, this is the testimony of Paul. Paul was one of those broken branches. If you remember, the Apostle Paul held the coats of the men who stoned Stephen in the book of Acts. And then right after that, Paul was given letters by the high priest to go and arrest and to have, have Christians thrown into prison. Paul sought to destroy the Christians because he thought he was being faithful to his roots, to the Jewish faith. But on the road to Damascus, Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And in that moment, he was forever changed. Paul, who had been a broken branch, was grafted back into the tree, grafted back in with the roots. That was his testimony. Again, God's plan has always been based on faith. And because God is sovereign, because God is above all things, He can graft in anyone who believes. You see, the only thing keeping these broken branches, these Jews had rejected, who had rejected Christ from being grafted back in, had been their unbelief. God's ways are not our ways, Scripture says. And His thoughts are not our, our thoughts. God turns conventional wisdom on its head here. God can and He will restore the Jewish people. I mean, if the Gentiles, if God could save the Gentiles and, and He could adopt them and bring them into His family, then why would He not be able to do the same for the Jewish people who were his chosen people and who were just who had just turned away from him and they were prodigals. If God could save the Gentiles who didn't know anything about him, then why couldn't he save the Jews who had a history and who knew the word of God, who knew the law? If he could do it for the Gentiles, he could do it for the Jews who had turned away. Verse 25, For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, so that you will not be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to the Gentiles, excuse me, to, excuse, has happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved. So here, Paul talks about this mystery, about this partial hardening uh, of the hearts that happened uh, to Israel. Again, Israel, part of Israel did not believe in Jesus. They didn't accept Him. They rejected Him. But again, because of that, Paul reminds the Gentiles, it was because part, part of the Jews rejected God that the message of salvation, that the, mess, the gospel message was able to go forth. If that hadn't happened, the Gentiles potentially might never have heard of Jesus. We, today, may have never heard of Jesus had that message not, uh, God, uh, had not gone out. But in His sovereignty, God allowed Israel to have a hardened heart. He allowed those particular Jews to have their hearts hardened against Him. But this hardening is temporary. God was at work in the Jews. He's still at work in the Jews to this very day.
So the hardening happened until what? The fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Well, what does this mean, the fullness of the Gentiles? Again, scholars believe different things. Potentially, this could mean until all of the Gentiles have come to faith in Jesus Christ. Then those other Jews who had hardened the heart who had hardened their heart, that hardening would be removed. Or it could be until the fullness of the Gentiles means until the gospel has reached all the Gentiles of the world. Until every Gentile has an opportunity to at least hear the gospel, this hardening of the heart uh, remains. But it was temporary. God has a plan in this, and he will see his plan through. Again, now, it, we have to be careful here in verse 26, and it says, So all Israel will be saved. We have to be careful because some have, have tried to understand or have interpreted this to mean literally all of Israel will be saved. And that's not that's not the case. Not all of Israel will be saved there because as we saw as we've seen in the past since the last 2000 years there have been many Jews that have died that were broken branches that had rejected Christ. So it's not that all, but it's all who believe all of these broken branches who realize that, no, I need to place my faith and trust in God, and then they have been regrafted into the tree. That is the all that will be saved. Verse 27, this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Verse 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, were, they are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of of the fathers. Verse 29, For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these also now have been disobedient, that because of the mercy shown to them, they also may be shown mercy. For God has shut up all in disobedience, so that He may show mercy to all. Again, God has a special place in His heart for the Jewish people. Because of the patriarchs and because of His relationship, because of the covenant, God has a special place in His heart. And God will not break His promises. God promised that He would make them a great nation. That through them salvation would come to the whole world, that all nations would be blessed because of them. God has not forgotten His promise. He has not forgotten His people. He has a history with the Jewish people, and He will not abandon them. God loves the whole world. He gives everyone a chance to be saved. Again, the Jewish rebellion caused people to question, especially the Gentiles, this, and they began to think that they were the new Israel. But that's not the case. They had been brought into Israel, but they were not the new Israel. We are not the new Israel. We have been brought in to the family of God. We're not any more special. God still has a plan for them. And it's, it's rooted in His kindness and His graciousness. Again, salvation is a gift made to all, both Jew and Gentile. Again, from the standpoint of the gospel, they were enemies for your sake. Paul talks about this, not just the Jews, but us as well. Before we were in Christ, we were enemies of God. Our sin has made us enemies of God. But from the standpoint of God's choice, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Still beloved, even though they were away, they were away from God. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For just as you once were disobedient to God, but now have been shown mercy because of their disobedience, so these now have, be, have been disobedient that because of the mercy shown to you, they also may now be shown mercy. 
So because they were disobedient, the gospel message went forth to the Gentiles and they came to know Christ. And now, because of that, God's going to use that in the future so that salvation will once again come back to uh, the Jewish people. The door remains open for the Jews to return to God. Again, salvation is a gift for all of us to receive. None of us is good enough to earn it. All of us must approach God in faith, in belief, in trust to receive salvation. Because of sin, each one of us is in prison. And when we repent of that sin, God changes everything. He frees us. God demonstrates His love and His kindness, His grace to us. Now, this is another important point in verse 32. For God has shut up all in disobedience so that He may show mercy to all. There are some who have taken this verse out of context and they have made this to say that in the end, God will save all. This is a position that's known as universalism. That in the end, all people will be saved. And let me tell you, church, this is a heresy. Universalism is a heresy. Not all people will be saved. There will be those that reject God. There will be those that have rejected the gospel message. And unfortunately, the punishment for that is death. Spiritual death, eternal separation from God in a place called hell. And it's very real. But everyone has the opportunity to avoid that. If we would simply believe in Jesus then we will be grafted in. So again, God challenging the Gentiles, don't become, Paul challenging the Gentiles, don't become so arrogant and think that you are so much better than the Gentiles. It's because they rejected Christ that the gospel even came to you. But just as God brought you into the family, He can re-graft them into the family. And so let me just kind of give us some thoughts uh, in closing. What does this mean? What does this message mean for us today? One, don't give up on those people that you know and love that haven't come to faith in Christ yet. It would have been real easy for them to say, well, you know, the Jews rejected him. Too bad, so sad. But no, Paul's saying, look, God has not forgotten them. There's going to be another chance for them to come back, and some will come back. So I want to encourage you today, if you have a loved one, if you have a friend that doesn't know Jesus, don't give up on that person. Keep praying for them. Keep crying out to the Lord for their salvation. Keep dropping those seeds of faith into their life. Look for those God moments where you can point God, point them to God. There's still time. Again, as long as we have breath in our body, there's still an opportunity to return to Jesus. And it may be years before they come, but just continue to faithfully share. I know I had a, a really good friend um, in uh, growing up through junior high and high school uh, that I prayed for him for many years. Uh, tried to take, took him to church, share the gospel with him many times, um, and for six years uh, faithfully prayed for him and tried to share with him. And finally, right before we graduated, he came to faith in Christ. I have an, another friend, good friend, same thing, put in the same time, but he never came to faith in Christ. And I don't know if he has come to faith in Christ today or not, but if he hasn't, I continue to pray for him that he will. And so I want to encourage you, don't give up. Paul's telling us don't give up uh, on people. Um, I think he's also encouraging us to take care. Don't become so prideful and arrogant. Uh, to think that we are secure. Now, again, I don't think Paul here is talking about losing our salvation. I do not believe you can lose your salvation. Scripture is clear um, uh, about that, that once we are in the Father's hands that no one can take us. But we need to guard against a false sense of security. Do we really have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Okay, because 
the Jews thought that they were in good standing simply because of their heritage, because of their heritage in the patriarchs. But see, your heritage does not guarantee your salvation. Just because you may have been raised in a Christian home, just because you may have gone to church your whole life, been involved in Sunday school, served on committees, give faithfully to the church, that doesn't ensure your faith in Jesus Christ. That doesn't ensure your salvation. There's only one thing that you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, that He is the Messiah, that God raised Him from the dead, that you surrender your life to Him, that you accept His gift of salvation, that you've called upon the name of the Lord. Only then is your salvation assured. We have to be careful because just because you may have said a prayer at some point in your life, even just because you may have been baptized, that doesn't guarantee your salvation the change that has occurred in your life. That's what guarantees your salvation. Has Jesus really impacted your life? Have you really given over your life? Because we can say words, but then our lives show something completely different. We have to be careful. We have to evaluate. Are we continually growing in our faith? I love this example that I read uh, by one uh, pastor. He said, our spiritual life is like trying to ride a bike uphill. That if we're not actively pedaling, then we'll be going backwards. How are we progressing? How are you progressing in your walk with the Lord? Are you continuing to move uphill? Or do you find yourself sliding backwards? You see, if we're not, as it's been said, if you're not actively killing sin, then it's killing you. Again, we have to ask ourselves, is Jesus really Lord of our lives? Or have we, have we simply just said, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. It's not enough just to acknowledge some facts about Jesus, but He has to be Lord of your life. He's either Lord of your life, or He's not Lord of all. So I want to encourage you today, church. I want to encourage you, don't give up on those in your life that you know don't know Jesus. Keep investing in them. Keep praying for them. Keep, keep um, investing in your own walk. Don't become complacent. Don't become content. Right now, there's a real temptation to become content in our walk with the Lord. Because we're not meeting regularly, because we're not there to challenge one another, spur one another on, um, there's a real temptation to kind of backslide and to neglect that time. If anything, God has blessed us with a greater opportunity than any other uh, to really get into the Word. We have the time. Invest in your time with God. Invest in your relationship with God. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God bless you. We'll see you next week.